How do electrical services actually work? Like there's the meter part, there's the panels, like what does it actually mean to have an electrical service? Why are there overhead ones? Why are there underground ones? Let's break into it. All right, so I had a great question that was asked in the comments below. Hello, I was curious if you're open to suggestions for future YouTube videos. Yes, ding, 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 it worked, good job. If so, how about a video covering services, explaining how the transformers operate, how the setup differs between 100 amp and 200 amp, underground versus overhead, why so many different setups, SE wire versus THHN in conduit, grounding impedance, etc. Thanks, Scott. Scott, I'm gonna try to answer all of this in as short a video as possible. I feel like you asked an hour worth of questions <laughs> or you asked the questions that would take me an hour to explain because I talk so damn much. Um, so I'm gonna try to answer that in a short form on the board. So an electrical service. Electrical service is typically the point at which electrical power comes into a, uh, a building or a structure. So say we have a house here, we have a big uh, industrial factory with a generator inside of it. We've got a pole with a transformer up on it. This is typically the entirety of an electrical system or as much as we need to know going to a building. So the important thing to note with services is that there's two different circuits that are happening to provide a service to an electrical or to a, to a building or dwelling or something like that. We have the primary circuit, which we all just put a P and then we have a secondary circuit, which is I'll just use S. You'll hear people use the term primary and secondary a lot when you start talking about transformers. But a primary circuit is a complete loop, a completed circuit all the way from a generator, all the way up to the primary coil inside of that transformer, and then all the way back to the generator through that coil. It is one complete loop, one complete circuit. Then we have a secondary circuit, which is the same exact thing. We have a complete loop all the way through the service, through the breakers, out to a piece of equipment, through the windings or the coil inside of that, all the way back out through the entire system. Now we might, because we tap the center point and we call that conductor neutral at a transformer, we might have another circuit which might take a different path. So we might have from this black through this equipment back through the neutral so we could have two completely different you know, circuits on a 220. We'd have two different loops happening or we could just have a 220 that's happening. But either way, without a load, the electricity is just sitting there with potential on it. There, it's not actually doing anything. There might be uh, current elsewhere in different buildings or something that might be making current in this primary um, actually do something. But on the secondary side, when there's no load connected, Everything's just open. So once we connect a load, now we have a completed circuit that actually allows current to flow. Um, and the amount of current that flows is why we determine different electrical service sizes. So we might have a 400 amp service, we might have a 100 amp service, 1200 amp service. Um, so that's what the differences of all of them are. You'll notice that there's a green conductor, but it's only right here. So an electrical service, you don't have a green conductor that comes from you know a ground or equipment grounding conductor that comes from a transformer or from the utility company and goes through and is connected to any of this we uh, essentially derive a ground by connecting the neutral to a green conductor or a bare conductor and we bring that out to the equipment so if there is ever a fault uh, or some like a ground fault is what we would call it if a conductor ever flops off of its terminal and actually lands on like the metal casing of a piece of equipment that there is a path back to neutral that will allow that breaker to trip um, so we, we run an equipment ground for a little bit different reason but this is pretty much the entirety of an electrical system brought to the service of a house we have a complete loop on our secondary side we have a complete loop on our primary side and uh, the primary side can influence the secondary side and vice versa. 
So if we back up a little bit, we have single phase and we have three phase, and there's a couple of different reasons as to why we would use each one. So say we have a, a utility company here, they probably have several different generators, but for easy of, uh, ease of drawing, um, I just drew one generator that's generating alternating current. You'll notice there's three conductors. There's a red, black, and blue that go through this entire thing all the way through the distribution network. Typically a utility company is gonna run three phase out into an area and they're gonna drop two phases off in certain places. So for right here, they might have tapped a neutral in the center point of that and dropped a neutral down, but essentially they're just taking the black and the red conductor and uh, from on the secondary side of this transformer, they're dropping a black and a red down. So the conductors that go out here, you'll notice they're never black, red, and blue. Utility side, their primary side, have different color conventions, um, but they're, it's, it's a completely different world. It's a different reasons to why they do things. They calculate their own conductors, their own insulation, all that kind of stuff. Um, so you're not gonna see these red, black, and blue, but out in the field, we label them so that we know which phase we're talking about when we're talking about different phases. So if we have single phase, all that means is that we have one huge canister we have a primary and we have a secondary. Single phase means single loop. You have a loop from black all the way through red, single, one, one loop, one circuit. Then we could have the three phase that's traveling through all of that. And we could have three of those canisters. So typically in three phase, we're gonna be talking about three different transformers. And those three transformers are can be wired together uh, a number of different ways, but essentially you're still gonna have a primary in one, a primary in another, and a primary in another. And then you're also gonna have a secondary in each one. I, there's no rhyme or reason to why the colors that I'm picking, but then you'll have a secondary, secondary, and a secondary. Now these can get wired together in different ways to make different things happen. You can have what's called Y electrical, W-Y-E, um, or you can have delta, which is a triangle. You can either wire all of these together in essentially a triangle on the primary side and a triangle on the secondary side, or you can put them together in what's called a Y configuration primary or secondary. And then there's a neutral point where all of them come together. That's where we would tap in our neutral, but just so that you know, there's a primary side, a secondary side, three phase means three loops or circuits, single phase means single loops or circuits. Now, there are different environments where you might come across three phase or single phase, typically in commercial or industrial, you're gonna see three phase because it's a more efficient way of powering things. And typically you're talking about a lot of things happening over a bigger building, a bigger area, lots and lots and lots of different things happening. So in commercial, usually uh, three phase is going to be running all of the lighting loads. Um, it's, you know, like rows and rows of lights for days. You've got cash registers, you've got all kinds of displays for things, um, computer equipment, you, you know, like, tons of things for people to come in and buy things. And so the more efficient way to have current happening is uh, by utilizing three phase. And single phase is a lot less efficient, but there's less going on usually in a residence at any point during the day. You might have a lot of things going on if you're throwing a party and lots of lights on and lots of things like that. But in commercial, you're operating things from like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Or, or later, you know, that's all day long. You need to have consistency and you need to be able to handle commerce coming in and out, tons of people, tons of employees, lots of power being used consistently throughout the day. So typically they'll use three phase power for that. And you can run each phase, you can run different things on each phase, or you can run a combination of things on all three phases at the same time, uh, or on two phases, you know. But that's why it's such an efficient and kind of a good thing to be using three phase in that environment. Some multifamily stuff, when I say multifamily, I'm talking about um, multiple dwellings together, so like an apartment complex or a fourplex or a duplex or something like that, where multiple different families can live in a same huge structure. Um, sometimes they will run three phase to that area. So you'll notice we have the three different uh, transformers up top, but they'll run single phase out of each one. So they might have like this set of units or building or whatever 
on black and blue phase where they'll split this one on black and red phase and then on this one they'll split red and blue and they're trying to balance out those loads a little bit they don't necessarily need three phase but it's more economical to provide three phase power and then just use each one of the single phases of that three phase to provide power to a certain building or, or structure and then we'll have like general just three phase where pretty much everything in the facility is being used as, as three phase loads you might have tons of motors in an industrial uh, building uh, tons of you know huge motors and generators and equipment welders and cnc machines and stuff and all of them rely on three phase power so you're literally bringing three phase power and everything that's being hooked up to it is three phase power you may still have some things that are single phase in there you might be taking three phase in transforming it and getting single phase out you might be getting delta three phase in and you might be getting y out because you need you know a neutral so that you can provide lights or something like that so there are such things as grounded systems and ungrounded systems just remember in code uh, anytime that you're talking about grounded you're talking about the neutral ed grounded and ungrounded that is neutral and hot just think those two things they turn a light bulb on right there's something similar about them they're both doing the same thing essentially you have grounding conductors with the ing and that's talking about the actual equipment grounding conductor the green or the bare that we run out that we call the ground um, but you might have some things out here that don't actually need a neutral so it would be an ungrounded system uh, which then you hear ungrounded and you're like, wait, doesn't that just mean the hot? It's like, no, <laughs> an ungrounded conductor, yes, is a conductor that is not grounded. It is a hot, but an ungrounded system uh, just means that there is no actual grounded conductor or neutral run. So there's no need for that because all of the equipment um, is running on the three phases. There's no need for a neutral. Now let's focus in a little bit closer. Uh, so say we've got this big uh, industrial you know, generator over here. We've got our light pole in the middle and we've got a house. So again, we're looking at a primary circuit, right? We've got on this side, we've got our, our P primary single circuit. Um, on this side, we've got our secondary, which is a single circuit that goes all the way from the transformer through the equipment and back through. The only way current travels is if there is a completed loop. And the only way to stop current is by opening the circuit and having a switch somewhere. That's why we have breakers. That's why we have switches, disconnects, things like that. Um, again, the ground over here is not actually connected to any of the rest of this. We just run a ground that bonds every piece of metal that's anywhere around electrical equipment that somebody could potentially get shocked, electrocuted, Electrocuted meaning dying, shocked meaning just getting shocked and hurt. Um, but then we have to bond our neutrals and our grounds together to make sure that if something does happen and there's some kind of crazy fault over here where a hot conductor actually touches, comes in contact with the metal of say a wash machine or something like that, that it can travel down this grounded con or this uh, grounding conductor for a split second of time, still connected to the neutral so it still has a completed uh, loop to get from the fault all the way back up to the transformer and completes a, a circuit. So it'll actually send a huge amount of current through the circuit and that breaker will, t uh, will, will uh, sense it and it'll trip that breaker. Um, and then we have a ground uh, that we run out to the actual earth and that's usually called the grounding electrode conductor. So if we have uh, a, an electrode that starts here and goes down to the earth, we call that the grounding electrode. And then if we have a conductor that goes from that electrode up to the uh, service panel that is called the grounding electrode conductor. So a grounding electrode conductor is only a conductor that conducts that connects the service uh, neutral down to the ground rod. It's just that short bit of conductor that uh, that connects to earth to the grounding electrode. Um, the uh, the equipment grounding conductor is a different thing. We call that EGC or equipment grounding conductor, and that goes out to equipment. Uh, it has a kind of a similar function. Really the grounding electrode is just to establish um, a conductivity with earth um, for different reasons for any line surges or any uh, lightning or anything like that that might happen. Um, establishing some kind of connection with earth to make sure that there's a similar potential during any kind of situation that might happen uh, throughout the electrical system. That's why there's a ground rod. 
uh, and a grounding electroconductor, but an equipment grounding conductor is to provide a fault path if there's a fault on a piece of equipment or in a circuit somewhere that can actually clear a fault and make a breaker trip. Um, I know that sounds probably really confusing if this is the first time you're coming across that information. I promise I'll have more videos out here that specifically talk about uh, grounding and bonding. I actually have a few videos. If you go dig through the catalog, there's videos on why we bond and when to bond and what grounding and all that stuff is. But that's a very, very complex topic. So there's like probably like 40 videos that we could do on it just depending on very specific situations and where we are. But that's not this video. We're just talking about services in general. We have the differences between the overhead service and the underground service. You're gonna see both of these out in the field in random places. Generally, the nicer the place, the more it's gonna be underground, the old ass places. You're gonna have overhead wires because back then, it was just easier to run a whole bunch of wires. Nobody really cared about, you know, the messiness of like scenery or being able to see through to your pretty mountains without having to see wires. Nobody really cared. We were just trying to live, you know, back in the day. But as we've gotten a little bit more modern in places where it's practical, where we can actually dig, putting an underground service makes sense because it's un, it's not as unsightly. You don't have these wires hanging around everywhere. Plus a lot of times in uh, in different you know residential areas, you have to have like a 15 or foot, a 20 foot clearance from those conductors before you can actually build a structure. So people that are you know in cities that don't have as much room, they want an underground service so they can actually build and kind of utilize more of their property and push the buildings. Maybe you have multiple buildings you know closer to the edges of the property where an, an underground service is gonna give you a lot more leeway where an overhead service, you have to stay away from those wires and those wires might span the entire length of your property. So um, that's the, the big pain with underground or overhead. A, it's just better looking, so nicer neighborhoods are gonna just have one of these little green pedestals that's sitting, or you know, big green box. Some of them might be massive green boxes depending on what it is, um, but generally you're gonna have one of those out by the street where an overhead service, you're gonna have a pole usually out by the street um, that your conductors are run across. Both of them are just fine. Uh, it's just different reasons as to why you would want one or the other. The other kind of crappy thing about the overhead is that you actually have to like, most of the times penetrate a soffit and go up through the, the, the soffit through um, your roof. And then you have this big thing hanging outside of your roof with wires tapped into it. Just kind of looks crappy, right? So that's the only difference between those. Um, but it's really just a matter of preference a lot of times or whatever the engineer spec. So sometimes you have uh, the ability to change it, sometimes you don't. If you're gonna dig underground, you have to have these burial depths. A lot of times you have to have 24 inches or I'll just go to 30 inches most of the time. And you have to get a rock saw or something and actually dig an entire trench and then you have to bury conduit and then you have to pull conductors through all of that conduit. Uh, whereas the um, overhead service a lot of the times your point of where you actually have to do anything is all you have to do is hook up conductors that the utility company brings all the way over to the house a lot of times here in an underground situation you have to meet the utility company here they have to crack open their uh, transformer and then you have to pull in the secondary all the way to the house depending on the situation sometimes they'll pull the secondary um, sometimes in an underground situation like this you'll have a manhole so that you will have to uh, they'll run their conductors and their responsibility stops right inside of here and your responsibility begins right inside of here. So you'll have to pull your conductors into a manhole. They pull their conductors into a manhole and they make all of the terminations there. And if anything has to be disconnected, they don't have to crack the whole transformer open. You can actually access this manhole and disconnect secondary if you need to. Um, whereas in this option, you literally just have to cut the conductors or you know maybe disconnect the, the the lugs or something like that either way you're going to have a meter so at an electrical service you have this meter that gets stabbed into the electrical service uh, and that is what's metering it's basically just monitoring how much current is flowing through uh, all of these conductors at any given point in time now, one thing to talk about really quick, uh, it was asked about the different sizes of, of um, services. So typically you're gonna have uh, different sizes depending on the loads that are being driven inside of this building or structure. Um, you might have 
uh, a very small house with lots of gas appliances, nothing really electric, so you might only have 125 amp service. You'll notice that the enclosure is much smaller because you don't have so many breakers, you don't need to put so much stuff in. The meter enclosure is gonna be smaller too, so that meter enclosure has metal inside of it and that metal is rated to hold a certain amount of current through it. Um, it's a bus, should have drawn that in there. So connecting each one of these conductors is going to be these little fingers. Well, those fingers are rated at a certain thing. And so this can might be 125 amp can. You could use like a 400 amp can if you wanted to. You don't need to, it's just gonna be a lot more expensive. But whatever the uh, meter can is rated at that the meter is actually physically going to stab into, um, the fingers on that meter are also rated at whatever it is. So you're probably gonna have a 125 amp meter can with a 125 amp meter that plugs into a 125 amp breaker on a 125 amp service. A breaker is only stopping current. It has, doesn't actually have anything to do with the panel itself. You can put any breaker in any panel almost um, as long as the brands match and it's the same like class of breakers for that brand. But what's important is inside of a 125 amp panel, what they're really saying is that the bus bars that connect all of the breakers are rated each. This one's rated at 125 amps and this one's rated at 125 amps. So that the black conductor that connects all of them on this side is going, is the maximum that it can draw is 125 amps before there starts to be damage to that bus but they're both 125 amps. So you don't add both together to be like, oh, I have a 250 amp panel. No, it's still 125 amp panel. It's just saying 125 amps per bus. You could put an 80 amp breaker on that if you wanted to, doesn't really matter. It's just that the bus has to be protected up to 125 amps, is, that's the maximum. You can't put a 200 amp breaker on that because you only have 125 amp buses. So if you ran like 200 amps through it and you had a 225 amp breaker on it, 225 amp breaker is not going to is not going to open right because we have 200 we have 200 amps flowing through 100 a 225 amp breaker it's not going to trip but these 125 amp buses are going to eventually degrade and probably cause everything around the area that's plastic to start melting from that heat that's built up and the breaker is never going to trip and sense it so uh, that's why we have certain breakers that are certain sizes. Now we don't actually add up every single breaker and then that's the size breaker that we put as our main. There's actual calculations that we have to do. There's a standard method calculation or the optional method calculation for dwelling services that we would use to figure out what kind of breaker and what kind of wire we have to actually feed this with and it has nothing to do with adding everything up. I've got a video that I did on that recently so search my channel for why we don't add up breakers. Um, but so there's that equipment, right? That's 125 amp equipment. If we look over here, it's a little bit different. We have 200 amp equipment. If you notice the conductors are thicker. So because there's a possibility of more loads being connected to this, there's more current that's going to flow through this entire system. So the conductors actually need to be able to handle more current flowing through them. So we always upsize the conductors. We have to upsize the breaker too because we don't want it just nuisance tripping all the damn time. No, we want it to be able to handle much more current flowing through it. So we upsize the size of uh, our breaker, but in a 200 amp rated panel, it's gonna have much more metal here for the buses as well. Those buses are gonna be able to handle more current flowing through them. So we have the wire, the overcurrent de uh, devices, which are the breakers uh, and the buses to, to uh, really think about when we're doing a service. Uh, we have a ground bar down here that we connect down to a grounding electrode. Uh, usually our ground and our neutral are going to be bonded together at the service and nowhere else. No other sub panels down the line because we don't want objectionable current. We don't want current flowing on two different paths or potentially multiple different paths to get back to clear a breaker. We want to guarantee that breaker is going to trip. So we always make sure that we bond at one point and that point is the service. There's different situations with transformers, things like that, that uh, we would have a separately derived system or something like a generator maybe that we would have, um, depending on if we had a floated neutral in a transfer switch or some kind of crazy. There's lots of different situations. It's hard to like say one thing because there's so many different situations that we do different things with, but essentially we want a single point where all of our uh, metal in the structure 
is bonded together uh, with our neutral so that we have a completed circuit so that we can trip a breaker. Uh, the reason that we would have different wire or different conduits raceways at a service is just a matter of preference. Sometimes it's a matter of the environment that we're in. Sometimes it's a matter of material cost. So a lot of times with the conductors that we'll use, uh, SE is service entrance conductor. So it's actually conductors that are rated for service entrance. Um, a lot of times they're kind of like binded together and twisted together with this like metal kind of conductor. Um, but that, that a lot of times gets twisted together as a conductor itself, but it's within some kind of sheathing like Romex would be. Uh, USC is a very similar thing. It's just underground rated. So it's underground service entrance cable where you cannot run this above ground um, and you can't run SE underground. So it has to be underground rated. They have different temperature ratings. So most of the time it's just a 75 degree conductor, but depending on if it's a multi-conductor cable or something like that, it might be a 90 degree. It's wet and dry, wet and dry, so you can use them in dry environments or wet environments. THHN you might use, uh, they're good for dry or damp environments. They're good up to 90 degrees Celsius as well. So the heat rise that it can handle is up to 90 degrees for that insulation before the insulation starts to break down uh, the insulation around the conductor. All of these have insulation around them. Each one's rated a little bit differently. So the insulation around a conductor is always the most important thing to think about. It's not the actual conductor itself. All conductors are just copper or they're some kind of amalgam of different metals, majority copper, but they're just conducting mediums. They're all the same pretty much. A number 12 is a number 12 is a number 12 is a number 12. But a number 12 SE or a number 12 THHN or a number 12 XHHW that's talking about that rubbery stuff around the conductor and each one can either handle a dry environment or a wet environment. If it's a dry conductor only and you introduce it to a wet environment, you can actually prematurely break down that insulation. And when you've got multiple conductors next to each other and you break down the insulation, boom, they can touch over time and short out and you damage the ability for that conductor to be used. You can cause a fire, all kinds of stuff. So all of these are talking about the insulation rating of these specific conductors not the conductor itself the conductor doesn't matter so anyways thhn you might run you know damp or dry if you have a certain type of conduit and you want to run thhn if you want it to be copper if you want it to be aluminum you might run xhhw 90 degrees 75 degrees so there's a little bit of flexibility um, in which rating you use, whether or not you use one in a dry environment only, or whether or not it can be in a you know wet or damp environment. A lot of the dual ratings have to do with the fact that they're rated at a certain environment at one temperature or a different environment at another temperature. And a lot of it has to do with whether it's wet or dry. Um, so that's pretty much it for the conductors. You, there's tons of other conductors you could use too. These are just some examples. Um, there's a whole chart, conductors in 310 in the National Electrical Code. You can sit and look through every one of the conductors to see why they're called what they're called and what their ratings are and all that kind of stuff. Some of them have maximum and minimum amperages that you can run through them, all kinds of cool stuff. So uh, lastly, I probably should have put and raceways. Uh, raceways or conduits, they're called raceways, conduits, tubing, um, but they're, uh, it's a raceway. It's a thing that we pass conductors through. Um, the reason we don't call it pipe, just so you know, is because we don't put water through it. So we put conductors through ours, our conduit, and that's why they're called raceways. It's because they're actually meant to have conductors go through them. It's the difference between a plumber's PVC pipe and an electrician's PVC pipe. They have pipe, we have raceway or conduit. So the reason why we might have different conduits, uh, again, very similar thing. It might just be cost. It might be design uh, restraints. It's a lot of places around here for doing an overhead service, we have to have rigid conduit. We can't put EMT up and put a weather head on it. We actually have to run rigid. Um, IMC, e EMT, like very similar kinds of things, um, but different ones have different thicknesses of walls, different rigidity that it can be used. So it's really difficult to cut through rigid. 
just in general, it's really hard to damage rigid at all, uh, even burying it underground. Um, but if you bury EMT underground, which you can't do, it's going to corrode like crazy and very quickly it's, it's going to just go to shit. So there's different environments on why we would use different conduits. PVC is probably going to be used underground only. There's Schedule 40 and Schedule 80, so a little bit different thicknesses and walls. Um, but if you're burying something underground, you're probably going to be using PVC. You might use rigid. You might even reinforce your corners with rigid just to do your 90s. Um, but still do PVC everywhere else. There's all kinds of different reasons as to why we use all of these things. Um, and I've been trying, I've been trying to make this video short, but you can see how much there is. And I'm trying to talk fast and go through this stuff, but there's just so much to it. So hopefully that gave you like a really good overview of electrical services, what they are, why we have, you know, meters and what the different wires are and single phase and three phase and different breaker sizes and all that stuff. So if you want me to do anything more specific and slow my ass down and do maybe a little bit more thorough coverage of something that I haven't already done, please leave some comments below. I really appreciate it. And if you guys have any other questions for videos that you want me to do, I've been pretty much all this year, 22, uh, 2022, that's what I'm gonna be doing is I'm just gonna be combing through comments. You guys have had so many suggestions and comments for videos over the years. So I'm finally just gonna spend this entire year answering your guys' comments and trying to give value in videos like this uh, rather than doing the Q&A stuff. So love you crazy people. See you in the next one. Best can to use it and video.